the most important question that Christians are going to have to answer. And that is, why do I choose the Bible? I know some of you probably already out there thinking, wait a second, you know, in the most important question, what is the plan of salvation? Or is baptism necessary? Or all the, the different questions that we have. It's interesting, once you've answered those particular questions, you still have to get back to, okay, what is the authority for your answer? Okay, you say the plan of salvation is this, where do you get it from? Or you say that baptism is necessary, but why? Where, where is that coming from? So ultimately, we're going to have to answer the question, why the Bible? Why not the Quran or, or the Book of Mormon or, or some other book that claims inspiration? And I want to point out right up front, it is not a crime to question Christianity. Amen? I think sometimes people who have been in the church a long time, you know, if somebody asks a question, we kind of look at them like, whoa, now you, uh -uh, you're not supposed to do that. If you are here and you're not a Christian, let me just say, hey, I would welcome you to ask questions because I don't believe God ever called us to a blind faith. So this morning we're going to answer this question. Why do I choose to believe the Bible? And in order to do that, here's what we're going to do. We're going to transport all of our minds into an academic classroom. College freshman year, maybe a, a biology class, where you've got a professor who thinks it's his job to basically empty your head of anything you've learned from your parents. He thinks it's his job to silence Christianity. So you're sitting in his class, and he hits something, and before you even realize what you're doing, your hand shoots up, and you question what he's just said. And you know, maybe he says something like, you know, that, that all people evolved from apes, or that we came from some big bang, and before you know it, man, that hand's up, and you say, I, I don't believe that. Now let me point out, if this were a real scenario, that professor at this point would be licking his chops. Because, oh man, he hopes he gets one of these, these Christian people in his class. And so he, he says, all right, based on what authority? You say you don't believe this, what is your authority then for that? You say, well, I... I believe it. I believe the Bible because that's how I was raised. Folks, let me tell you something. That is the worst answer that we can give. If somebody says, why do you choose to believe the Bible? Please, please, please promise me you will never say, well, I believe the Bible because that's how I was raised. That's not real good because if you stop and think logically for just a moment, could everybody use that same answer no matter where they are in life? Atheist, Muslim, that's how they were raised. And so at that point, he starts actively salivating. He says, okay, let me, let me get this straight. You believe the Bible. It's your authority because you say that's how you were raised. And yet you sit here on a college campus paying me money to teach you things. So uh, apparently your Bible doesn't hold all authority. And oh, by the way, if your Bible was capable of giving you this knowledge, why do you need me? Secondly, don't you already know that there's things about which your parents were wrong? Now, if you're an 18 or 19-year-old, have you already figured out that some parents are wrong? Oh, yeah. Like, like for instance, your mom, it's February, it's like... 15 degrees outside, and she says, put on a hat so you won't catch a cold, right? Well, by 18, you already know that's not true because a cold is a virus. You don't get it through your head. Or how about this one? Don't make your eyes look like that or they'll stay that way. Well, no, they won't. 
And by 18 or 19, you know that there's some things that your parents have said which were wrong. That's not a good answer. So please, 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 if somebody asks you, okay, why do you choose to believe the Bible? Please don't say, well, that's how I was raised. Let me give you another answer that's no good. In this, this age of experience where everybody thinks, oh, it's all about emotions and, and how you feel, there are some out there that would say, well, you know, I tried it, and it changed my life. <laughs> yeah, okay. Has anybody else ever tried anything that changed their life? And so maybe the professor looks at you and says, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, let, let me tell you a little story about a man who... His parents died when he was very, very young, so he had to go live with his sister in New England. Lo and behold, while he was living with his sister up in Massachusetts, he got in with the wrong crowd. Being in the wrong crowd, he ended up in prison. While he was in prison, some guys came to him and they said, hey, you need to bow your knee in submission to Messiah. But he refused until one night he had a personal experience. He bowed his knee, and from that point forward, this guy was a model prisoner. In fact, he got released early, credited with starting over 100 different congregations. In fact, in almost every major city, there is a street named after this guy. His name, Malcolm X. His Messiah was Mohammed. Now, let me give you the rest of the story. Before Malcolm X actually passed away, he realized that his experience was a sham. He denounced the nation of Islam. They ended up assassinating him. So follow me for just a moment. Here is a guy who he had an experience, and by the end of his life, he knew it was wrong. So that's not a real good answer either, is it? Or how about somebody who says, well, you know, I've tried it, and it works for me. Again, if somebody's saying, why do you believe the Bible? This isn't a good one. Because how about the the alcoholic who is taking a 12-step program, right? Somewhere around step two or, or three, they are supposed to announce a higher power. But this guy, he, he doesn't believe in a God, so here's what he does. For grins and giggles, he looks out his apartment window, he sees a neon sign, and he decides that's going to be his higher power. He's been sober for a year and a half. He's tried it. It works for him. So using that kind of logic, here's what that means. That means that neon burrito sign has as much authority and as much power as your Bible. That's a problem. Please understand the Bible is not true because it works for us. It works for us because it is what? It is true. So how do we answer this question? Why do I choose to believe the Bible? I'm going to give you the answer that I hope you'll use. In fact, I would love for three or four of you in this room to have an occasion where you are able just to almost verbatim give this answer, and then I'm going to show you where we derived it from. Okay? Imagine a student sitting in a classroom, Teacher says something, student says, I, I, don't, I don't believe that. Professor says, oh, really? Based on what authority? Person says, the Bible. He says, oh, why the Bible and not something else? And so the student says, I choose to believe the Bible because it's a reliable collection of historical documents written down by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies and claim their writings are divine rather than human in origin. That's a whole lot better than saying 
Well, that's how I was raised. Now, let me show you where we pulled that from. If you got a Bible, go ahead and open it up, 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to take this section by section so that you can fully comprehend and, and understand why I would give you that particular answer. 2 Peter chapter 1, take a look at verse 16. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from the heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do, do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Look at what Peter's doing right here. Man, it looks like he's given a defense of the Bible. Brad, why, why do you choose to believe the Bible? I choose to believe the Bible because it is a reliable collection of historical documents. Every single one of those words is important. It's reliable. It's a collection. In fact, when you compare the Bible to other ancient books, like the Book of Mormon, the Quran, and you start asking things like, hey, how are they put together? How many authors? For the Bible, well, somewhere around 40, over a period of about 15 to 1,600 years, three different continents. By the way, many of the authors never saw any other author. They didn't collaborate. Three different languages, Hebrew, Greek, with some Aramaic. And so what you've got is not just a, a single volume that somebody went in a cave and said, hey, you know, the, the angel Gabriel visited me and I, I'm the new last prophet. Now, what you've got is a reliable collection of historical documents. In fact, take back, look at 2 Peter chapter 1. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. These aren't fables. These aren't myths. This is a reliable collection of historical documents. Now let's add the next part. Written down by eyewitnesses. Is eyewitness testimony good? Like if you were to go out here on Walton Boulevard and somebody just plows into you and they're trying to claim that it was your fault, but there's five eyewitnesses that saw they are the ones that actually are at fault. Is that eyewitness testimony good? Oh, yeah. Notice what it says. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw it. Okay, maybe that's not good enough for you. Maybe, maybe we need a little bit better. So if you have your Bibles open to 2 Peter, let's go just a little bit over to the book of 1 John. Take a look, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. Because I, I think maybe he's trying to say something here in the text. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the words of life. Man, it, lo it looks like he's trying to say something right there, right? All right, maybe verse 2 will help us out. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Wow, oh, sound, like, sound like he's trying to kind of make a point. Surely verse 3 will like clear it up, right? Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard and declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Brad, why do you choose to believe the Bible? I choose to believe the Bible because it is a reliable 
collection of historical documents written down by what? Eyewitnesses. Okay, now add this part. During the lifetime of what? Other eyewitnesses. Let's say it together because you guys are trying to fall asleep in the rain. Here we go. I choose to believe the Bible because it's a reliable collection of historical documents written down by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. Here's what that means. That means if the eyewitnesses got it wrong and they made up something, there were people around that could say, "Uh uh-uh, that didn't have it happen. We, We call that falsifiable. In fact, flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and let's see if there were actually other eyewitnesses around that could have stood up and said, that's not how it happened. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 3, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. He was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present. But some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. Notice what I I highlighted and underlined right there. Of whom the greater part remain to the present. When Paul wrote this, more than half of them were still living. He says, yeah, some have died, some have, have gone to sleep, but more than half of them are still around. You can talk to them. You can verify what I'm telling you. So, Brad, why do you believe the Bible? I choose to believe the Bible because it's a reliable collection of historical documents written down by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. He says, yeah, okay, whatever. But you got a problem. Because your Bible, your, your Bible's been translated too many times, you know. You, you got all kinds of errors and problems in it. And, and then maybe he tells the class something like this. Have any of you in this room ever played the game telephone? You know, where, where I whisper in somebody's ear over here and it makes it all the way around to the other side. And by the time we get over here to Garrett, Garrett has no idea what I originally said over here, Right? I mean, he wouldn't anyway, but you know what I'm saying, right? Okay, a professor that says that is either evil, ignorant, or both. Because here's what he's saying. He's saying, if I were the original, say, New Testament manuscripts, right? And Luke, right here, he he is going to be the King James 1611 version. So I go to him, and he translates, and now we've got an English representation of God's word. The next version, say the Revised Standard, the New American Standard, do they go to him, or do they come back to me? See, it's not a me tell him and then he tell, and we go all the way around the room. No, what it is is I tell him and I tell him and I tell her and I tell her and I tell him all the way till we get over here to the ESV when now we've got a couple thousand more manuscripts and I tell him, which really means this. The fact that it has been translated so many times is actually in our favor. Because, folks, if there were problems or errors, they would have showed up by now. By the way, at this stage in history, you don't even have to know Greek or Hebrew. Computer, you can type in the English, it'll spit out the Hebrew. You type in the Hebrew, it'll spit out the English. So when I look at it, I I sit there and kind of scratch my head going, away and say, you you don't believe this because it's been translated so many times? Okay, how about some of these other horrible books that you're making me read on a college campus? Like Homer's book, Iliad. Some of y'all had to read that, right? It's right up there with that book that Steve brought up yesterday, Noah's Ark of Feasibility Study. It's a great book if you have trouble sleeping, okay? 
That book was written in 700 B.C. The earliest manuscript that we actually have, about 1,500 years later, 800 A.D. There's only 643 manuscripts. We look at Herodotus' history book. Again, written in 425 B.C. The earliest manuscript we've got, about 900 A.D. There's only eight of those. Josephus' Jewish War. Written in 70 A.D., 400 A.D. is the earliest manuscript. There's only nine of those. Tacitus, there's actually only two of his manuscripts. Take a look at the New Testament. And I really need to update this slide because we now have something that actually they think goes back to 118. So Bible completed about 100 A.D. We now have manuscripts that go to about 118. That means we have manuscripts that were written during the lifetime of some of those people, the original authors. By the way, we don't just have 643 or 8 or 9. We have over 6,000 manuscripts, pieces of manuscripts that help me know this book right here is exactly what God intended me to have. By the way, a God that can create the universe can certainly get me his word that I need in my hands. Amen? He says, all right, okay, it's fine. So you got a good history book. So what? Let's add the next section. I choose to believe the Bible because it's a reliable collection of historical documents written down by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events. Now, these aren't like superhuman events. This isn't Marvel or, or DC. This is supernatural. In fact, take a look back at 2 Peter chapter 1, where he says, For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from this excellent glory, saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. What is Peter talking about right here? The transfiguration. Anybody think that's probably a pretty cool supernatural thing? Or, or how, about, how about this one? Jesus tells his disciples, hey, y'all go on ahead. I'll catch up with you. And somewhere in the middle of the night, <clears throat> You just picture the disciples there looking out going, um, did Jesus tell us how he's coming? Because he's coming. Not in a boat. He's walking on water. Is that supernatural? Or how about this? Dead, three days later, he's risen. That's supernatural? Oh, yeah. We go on to state this. So I choose to believe the Bible because it's a reliable collection of historical documents written down by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events, notice this, that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies. Now, I realize in modern times we got like all these Joel Osteen prophets and Dion Warwick psychic connections and all that kind of stuff. Let me just tell you, okay? Save you $9.99 a minute. I can look out into this crowd and tell you guys somebody in this room got a backache. Somebody in this room has lost their job. I'm not talking about those kind of prophecies. I'm talking about specific prophecies where he mentions the names of towns, family lineages, the condition of somebody's birth, the condition of somebody's death. In fact, flip over to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53, written somewhere around 701 to 681 B.C., okay? So round numbers, about 670 years before Jesus ever walked the earth, okay? 
Isaiah says this, We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. What's he talking about? He's talking about the crucifixion of Jesus, right? Okay, maybe, maybe that's not old enough for you. Maybe, you know, maybe some of you guys in this room are a little more skeptical than that. Let's go back a little further. How about a thousand years before Jesus ever walked the earth? We flip over to Psalm chapter 23. Take a look with me. Psalm chapter 23, actually 22, I'm sorry. Very first verse ought to be very familiar to everybody in this room. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why, why would that be familiar to you? Because those are the words of who? Jesus from the cross. Keep looking. Let's, let's skip on down to, oh, uh, let's see. How about verse 6? I am a worm, no man, a reproach of men, despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake their head saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Verse 14, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a posture. My tongue clings to my jaws. That's interesting. I remember one of the sayings of Jesus from the cross was, I thirst. You have brought me to the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. Wow, that's really interesting because during Jesus' day, the Jews actually called Gentiles dogs. And Romans were considered Gentiles, weren't they? He says, dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count on my bones. Yeah, they hadn't broken it. They didn't break his legs like they did the other two. He says, they look and they stare at me. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing, they cast lots. Why is this a big deal? This is a big deal because this was written roughly a thousand years before Jesus ever walked the earth. And oh, by the way, it was written by a guy who never saw a crucifixion because they hadn't been invented yet. So do I, I think that's a pretty big deal. Yeah, I do. Right, well, why do you choose to believe the Bible? I choose to believe the Bible because it's a reliable collection of historical documents written down by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of what? Other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events. Not superhuman, supernatural. That took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies claim their writings are divine rather than human in origin. So notice this last little phrase right here. Does the Bible make claims that it is inspired? Like, even in 2 Peter, flip back over there with me real quick. Look at verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So then our old professor says, yeah, okay, whatever, but you, you, can't, you can't trust the Bible because it was written by men. Okay, it is my hope and prayer at this point that your child or grandchild has enough knowledge to look at him and say, oh, really? I can't trust it because what about all these other books that were written by what? Men. You say, I can't trust it. Well, then guess what? I don't have to take my calculus test because it's got like Pythagorean theorems and stuff in it that were written by men. And he says, all right, well, you know, I, I would believe the Bible if you could prove it to me scientifically. All right, at this point, I'm licking my chops. Because at this point, here's what I realize. I realize 
Two things. Number one, this guy doesn't even belong to be in this discussion because he doesn't know enough about the historicity of the Bible. And number two, he doesn't know enough about the scientific method to be having this conversation. That the scientific method says that things have to be observable, measurable, and repeatable. Correct? Well, here's a news flash for you. Historical events are not observable, measurable, and repeatable. That's not what we use to prove things in the past. If I said, hey, I want you to prove George Washington lived, you wouldn't use the scientific method. No, what you would use is what we use in a courtroom, the evidentiary method. Is there sufficient evidence to prove this? The answer in the Bible's case, absolutely. So again, Bible, three different languages, three continents, 40 authors, six, about 16,000 years or 1,600 years, no contradictions. And folks, you got all kinds of good info that you can use for that professor. I started this by pointing out, please, 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 whatever you do, don't use the, well, I, I believe the Bible because that's how I was raised. Because when we do that, what we're doing is we're showing that professor that deep down, we, we don't think that there's really good evidence for this thing. We're just following in the footsteps of our parents. And if that's good enough for us, it's also good enough for the atheist, for the Muslim, for the Mormon, for everybody. Now, I just raced through that. I'm going to throw one last slide at you just for fun. If all else fails, you can look at them and say, well, you know what? I tried it and it worked for me. Because that's what Peter sums up in verse 19 when he says, so we have the prophetic word confirm, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. I tried it. It worked for me. And you need to try it too. I appreciate very, very much your attention this morning. Hopefully that has peeled back a little bit of why we believe the Bible to be the authority. But here's my last point. I just transferred responsibility from me to you. Because I can prove that it's inspired. I can prove that it's the authority. So now the last remaining question is, what are you going to do with it? Will you actually heed what it says? I appreciate very, very much your attention. We'll get ready for worship together. Thank you.